Hey everybody, this is a piece from The Fate of the Russian Revolution, Volume 1, Lost Texts of Critical Marxism, edited by Sean Matt Gamna. Um, the, the description of the book says, what was the USSR? Was it socialism? A powerful body of critical Marxist analysis of the USSR from the 40s and 50s remains largely unknown. This work of critical rediscovery vindicates those who made the revolution, who fought Stalinism until it killed them. It traces efforts to remake a democratic revolutionary socialist movement during the mid-century events that shaped the world since. And the piece that I'm reading is C.L.R. James. The USSR is a fascist state capitalism. For many years, the fact that in Russia the means of production were state property was sufficient for the Fourth International to characterize the working class as ruling class and the Russian state as a worker state. Today, however, 1941, side by side with a tremendous but declining rate of industrial expansion in Russia, the working class has been reduced to a state of pauperization, slavery, and degradation unequaled in modern Europe. The real wages of the workers are approximately one half of what they were in 1913. A bureaucracy holds all economic and political power. To continue to call the Russian workers the ruling class is to make a statement without meaning. Yet Trotsky never wavered from this position. It led Trotsky, the direct successor of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, into calling upon the workers of Russia to be the best soldiers in an army that was, according to Trotsky's own statement, acting as the tool of an imperialist power. The Workers' Party, in refusing to accept this position and in calling upon the Russian workers in this war to turn the guns in the opposite direction, made a profound break not with all that we have th th thought, on the Russian question, but with something far more important, with how we have thought about it. So profound a difference must convince the party that we f what we face is not a rehash or manipulation of our previous ideas, but a fundamental revaluation. Dot, dot, dot. Marx rests his theory of society upon the technical level of the instruments of production under given historical circumstances. Quote, Assume a particular stage of development in the productive forces of man and you will get a particular form of commerce and consumption. Assume particular stages of development in production, commerce, and consumption and you will have a corresponding social order, a corresponding organization of the family and of the ranks and classes, in a word, corresponding civil society, end quote. These are Marx's own words. The purely historical, i.e. the chronological analysis of society, places property first. Logical the logical method of Marx examines the actual historical relations always an expression of the logical analysis, which begins with the technical level of the instruments of production. This determines the relation of the people to each other and the division into classes, which then determine the relation of the classes to the instruments of production and the results of labor. These last, usually expressed in laws, are the relations of property which from his earliest writings Marx always defined as an expression of the mode of production. This is the strict Marxian terminology and the strict Marxian sequence as can be seen from a casual reading of the preface to the critique of political economy and the Communist Manifesto. Um, oh, there's a footnote here. It says, this is, the, this is referring to the text that I'm reading. A bridge resolution on the Russian question to the 1941 Workers' Party Convention by C.L.R. James, whose uh, alias was uh, J.R. Johnson dated September 1941. Applying this method to Russia, we find that in 1941, the technical level of production, unsupported by one or more powerful socialist states, compels a social relation of exploited wage laborers and appropriating capitalists. In order to achieve the bourgeois democratic revolution in 1917, the proletariat was compelled to seize power, but this seizure of political power was due chiefly to the incapacity of the ruling class and the conjunctural historical circumstances. The working class lacked the maturity and production of a proletariat which was a majority of the population and had been trained and disciplined by large-scale capitalism.
All political power rests in the last analysis on and is determined by production relations. This is the reason for the insistence of Lenin and Trotsky that without the proletarian revolution on a worldwide scale, the Russian proletariat was doomed to sink back to the position of wage slaves, i.e. the restoration of Russia to capitalism. This is exactly what has happened. The whole society has turned itself slowly over, and once more, the working class has been pushed back into that submissive role in production which is determined by the low technical level of the productive forces judged on a national scale. The bureaucracy is completely master in the productive process, and that is the basis of its political power. No more convincing expertise position of Marx's theory of a society resting on the technical level of production can be wished for. Contrary to expectation, the role of managers of production has not been seized by members of the old ruling class. The definition of the class, which is today master of Russia, must rest on an analysis of the mode of production which now prevails. The historical conditions of capitalist production are as follows. 1. The existence of the world market. 2. The existence of a class of, quote, nominally free, and quote, wage laborers. 3. The ownership of monop or monopoly of the means of production by a class which rules production and disposes of the property. 4. Production by private persons for a free and uncertain market. Such a society produces a certain type of product, the capitalist commodity, which has its own special commodity characteristics. The labor contained in the capitalist commodity has the double aspect of both use value and exchange value. To use Marx's own words, quote, all understanding of the fact depends upon this, end quote. And any analysis of Russia which describes Russia as a society, quote, unforeseen, end quote, by Marxists, but yet omits a consideration of this and other aspects of the law of value, is so inadequate as to be not only misleading but valueless. The law of value can be rejected. It cannot be ignored or allowed to go by default in a Marxist party. The Marxian law of value, however, is merely an expression of a certain type of society. This certain type of society, contrary to all other societies we have known and expect to know, makes the extraction of surplus value, called in this instance surplus value, me, the extraction of surplus labor, called in this instance surplus value, the main aim of production. For Marx, quote, the capitalist mode of production, bracket, is, and bracket, essentially the production of surplus value, the absorption of surplus labor, end quote. This is crucial. Quote, it must never be forgotten that the production of this surplus value, the reconversion of a portion of that surplus value into capital for accumulation, forms an indispensable part of this production of surplus value, is the immediate purpose and compelling motive of capitalist production. It will not do to represent capitalist production as something which capitalist production is not. That is to say, as a production having for its immediate purpose the consumption of goods or the production of means of enjoyment for capitalists. This would be overlooking the specific character of capitalist production which reveals itself in its innermost essence, end quote. This is the main aim of production in Stalinist society, which reveals itself in its innermost essence, end quote. This is the main aim of production in Stalinist society, a capitalist society. All other societies produce for consumption and enjoyment. All previous societies produce surplus labor, but except in isolated instances, wants or use values were the main purpose of production. It is only in a society where labor is free of all contact with the means of production within the environment of the world market that the contradiction between production for use and for surplus value dominates the whole society. Marx speaks of the difference between the use value and the exchange value of the commodity as the antithesis of the commodity. The contradictions and antagonisms of capitalistic society are merely embodiments of this antithesis of the commodity. 
which is to be resolved by the synthesis of socialism, i.e. by the reuniting of the man of labor and the means of labor, and the abolition of the capitalist world market. International socialist society will produce surplus value, but it once more has its sole aim, as its sole aim, the production of use values. Today, this antithesis between production for use and production for surplus labor can be seen nowhere so clearly as in Stalinist Russia, and that stamps this society as being of the same inner essence as capitalism. Up to 1928, the use value of the commodity dom predominated to the limited extent that this was possible in a backward country in the environment of the world market. The industrial proletariat in the year in the year in that year lived, excuse me, in 1928 lived at the very least up to the standard of 1913. The first five-year plan predicated doubling of the subsistence of the working class by 1932, but from 1929 a decisive change began: the lowering of agricultural prices in the world market threw the Russian plan into chaos. The competition on the world market, in its modern form of imperialist war, compelled the bureaucracy to reorganize the plan to meet the threat of Japan at heavy cost, and with the coming to power of Hitler and his announcement that the main enemy was Russia, the change in Stalinist production and in Stalinist society became more uncontrollable. The bureaucracy was compelled to continue the process of industrialization at feverish speed. Under such circumstances, in a backward country with an immature working class, the main aim of production inevitably must become the production of surplus labor. For the sake of more production, for the sake of still more production, and all this at the cost of the working class. This is the specific characteristic of a capitalist production. This economic necessity compelled an enormous increase in the repressive apparatus, the consolidation of the ruling bureaucracy by concrete privileges, honors and authority, and the destruction of persons and ideology connected with the October Revolution. The necessity of autarky attempting to produce all that Russia needed within its own borders resulted in further disruption of production and the mounting indices of production as a consequence represented large uneconomic investment, thus increasing the strain upon the workers. Stakhanovism was a perfect expression of the qualitative change in Russian society. The climax came in 1936 to 1937 with the partial breakdown of the economy as exemplified by the charges of Trotskyite sabotage in every branch of production. In the historical circumstances of Russia, the antithesis between the production of surplus value and use value has been reached has reached a stage unknown in other capitalist economies. The state of world economy today precludes any thought of a cessation of this cessation of this mode of production. The economic power of the bureaucracy precludes that this can be done otherwise than at the continued and growing expense of the working class. The system has developed in every essential of production into a capitalist system, and the parasitic bureaucracy has been transformed into an exploiting capitalist class. Henceforth, its law of motion must be the same as that of other capitalist societies. An approximate date for the completion of the process is 1936, the year of the Stalinist constitution. That the laws inherent in capitalist production in Russia manifest themselves in unusual forms is obvious, but their unusualness in Russia is not unique. It is exceeded by the, cap by the capitalism which Marx himself invented. To deduce the laws of capitalist production, Marx constructed a capitalism such as never existed and never could exist. The very method on which capital was constructed is a warning to all hasty and ill-based attempts to baptize societies as never before seen from a consideration of their external forms of manifestation and not from an analysis of their laws of motion. 
the, quote, free and uncertain, end quote, market of, quote, pure, end quote, capitalism has been abolished before mm -hmm. now in a national society. Lenin in 1917, before the revolution, stated that the immense majority of the capitalists in Russia were not producing for the market at all, but for the state which advanced them money. It, is, it was not commodity production which he, ex, which he explained was production for a free and uncertain market. It was not, quote, pure, end quote, capitalism, the quotes are his own, but, quote, a special type of national economy, end quote. In Germany today, that process Lenin described is immensely more advanced than that process was in Russia. It would be a perversion to assert that production in Germany is for a free and open market. It would be equally disastrous to see in this abolition of the traditionally free capitalist market a basic change in the society. The law of motion is not thereby altered. To the contrary, it is the nature of the law of motion to abolish the free market. In Russia, the commodity is no longer the product of private individuals. But the commodity is, however, the law me, but it is, however, the law of capitalist production to abolish the private character of capital. Thus, Marx expected the revolution to occur before this was completed alters not one thing in his analysis of the movement of the society. The joint stock company is, quote, the abolition of capital as private property within the boundaries of capitalist production, end quote. The concentration of all available capital in the hands of the Bank of England, quote, does away with the private character of capital and implies in itself to that extent the abolition of capital, end quote. The climax of this process is the ownership of all capital in the hands of the state. The bourgeoisie continues to draw dividends, but the drawing of dividends does not make a system capitalist. The dividends can be drawn from a worker's state. It is, in fact, it is the fact that the state acts as the entrepreneur and exploits the workers that is decisive. An identical process of production in Russia moves inevitably to a similar result. The laws of capitalist production, always imminent in an isolated workers' state, and more so in a backward economy, have been forced into action in the environment of the world market. The organic composition of capital in Russia mounts with the growth of industrialization. Year by year, however, the mass of surplus labor must grow proportionately less and less. Marx worked out his final theory of accumulation on the basis of the total social capital in the country and denied this altered the economic and historical characteristics of the society. The expenses of an exploiting class within the environment of the world market, the privileges necessary to differentiate the classes, a vast military apparatus, increasing degradation and slavery to the worker, the lowering of his individual productivity, at a stage when it needs to be increased. All these features of Russia are rooted in the capital wage labor relation and the world market environment. The advantages that Russia alone enjoyed in 1928, centralization of the means of production, capacity to plan, have today been swamped by the disadvantages of the quest for surplus labor. It is traditionally capitalist troubles the to its traditionally capitalist troubles, the bureaucracy adds one of the bureaucracy's own, an excessive waste due to the bureaucratic administration. But Stalin today, like Hitler, contends essentially with the falling relation of the mass of surplus value to the total social capital. That is the economic basis of the constantly growing persecution of the workers by the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is no worse than any other ruling class. It behaves as it does because it must. This is the law of motion of Stalinist society. Ultimately, the productive apparatus of Russia will stand as impotent as Germany's in 1932, and for the same reason, its incapacity to produce the necessary surplus labor, which is the compelling motive for production of any modern class society. The struggle in Russia is not over consumption, as Trotsky thought, but over production. And the Stalinist state is organized nine-tenths, not for stealing, but for production. The party must make this clear in all its propaganda and agitation and correct this error. This is extremely important, this quote here, because this is something you're going to find um, 
and Castoriadis as well. Um, is that um, uh, Trotsky basically had the idea that, uh, at least to my understanding, is that the Soviet Union was existed as a worker state um, on the grounds that nationalized property was in place and that planning uh, was a <coughs> ostensibly the ruling mechanism um, over the economy. Um, the distribution, which was uh, growing um, in deeply iniquitous, uh, was not the result of exploitation in production, but by uh, a certain criminal leeching bureaucracy uh, uh, siphoning off surpluses to itself. So, um, for Trotsky, um, the inequalities and the despotism that existed in Stalinist society um, had very limited, or I would say he would had the view that nothing had nothing to do with production, everything to do with uh, um, distribution. Um, he kind of creates this uh, this space between. Um, this kind of like segregation between distribution and consumption, um, which other people are going to reject. So it's important that uh, James says it here. The struggle in Russia is not over consumption, as Trotsky thought, but over production. And the Stalinist state is organized nine tenths, not for stealing, but for production. The party must make this clear in all the party's propaganda and agitation and correct this serious error. This is the reply to all who see some new type of society superseding capitalism and solving so capitalism's contradictions. All of these, are theory these theories are distinguished by their absence of economic analysis, by the flimsiness of their assumptions. If the party should adopt the same empirical method in its own analysis, it will completely emasculate its own capacity to answer and destroy the arguments of those who herald the managerial society, the, quote, new, and quote, fascist order the garrison state, etc. This theory is the heritage that Marx left for the proletarian movement, and it's here that we must be clear or be always in confusion. All imperialism was not necessarily of the particular type Lenin analyzed. Japan and Russia were not, as he said, quote, modern, up-to-date finance capital, end quote. As he, as he explained, their military power, their domination of colonial territories, their plunder of China, etc., made them imperialist. By 1914, imperialism was therefore a struggle for all or any kind of territory for the sake of the territory and in order to prevent rivals getting hold of that territory. This was done to control raw materials, to export capital, to expand the commodity market for strategic purposes, in fact, for any purpose which would contribute to the increase of surplus value. That is the obvious economic basis of Stalinist imperialism. Like Hitlerism, Stalinist imperialism will seize fixed capital or agrarian territory tin mines or strategic ports and transport manpower within its own borders the bureaucracy mercilessly exploits the subject nationalities um the main instance i can think of that is uh holodomor um, in ukraine um should it merge victorious in the coming war it will share in all the grabbings of its partners, and for the same reason. Trotsky's idea that the bureaucracy seeks foreign territory merely to expand the bureaucracy's power, prestige, and revenues lays the emphasis on the consumption of the bureaucracy. That is false. The, quote, greed, end quote, of the capitalist class is a result of the process of production, and the greed of the bureaucracy has the same roots. With a productivity of labor as low as that productivity of labor is in Russia and the overhead expenses of an exploiting society within the environment of the world market as large as they are equal to that of the most highly developed capitalist states, 
It is not possible for the bureaucracy to escape the fu same fundamental problems of production as an advanced capitalist state and to move towards the same attempts at solution. If the relations of production in Russia are capitalist, then the state is fascist. Fascism is a mass petty bourgeois mo movement, but the fascist state is not a mass petty bourgeois state. Fascism is the political reflection of the drive toward complete centralization of production, which distinguishes all national economies today. Finance capital and interlocking directorates are a result of the growing concentration of capital and the increasing socialization of production. The contradiction between this socialization and the appropriation of the product for the benefit of a few drives the few into a position where to survive they must act as one against the workers and against the external bourgeoisie. The fascist state has deeper economic roots than we have hitherto acknowledged. In this respect, the development of Russia is a signpost as to the future of capitalist society. In 1878, Engels and Marx approved made a statement of the most profound significance for the modern world, that the growing socialization of production would compel the capitalists to treat the productive forces as social forces, so far as that was possible within the framework of capitalist relations. How far is that possible? Today, life and Marx's capital teach us the probable extent and limits of this process. Dot, dot, dot. Today, the capitalist class, impelled to treat the productive forces as social forces, so far has left the property relations intact, but the group in control manipulates the surplus value more and more as a whole. Less and less capital is apportioned to production by competition. In Germany today, capital is consciously directed to different branches of production. The process will continue. The capitalists abolish the free market and shape circulation as far as possible to their own purposes, rationing every commodity including labor power. But the one fundamental condition of capitalist production, the sale and purchase of labor power and the process of production, volume one, that they can alter that they cannot alter without destroying themselves. Lenin, in the last two pages of imperialism as early as 1916, saw that with the increasing socialization of production, quote, private economic relations and private property relations constitute a shell which is no longer suitable for its contents, a shell which must of necessity begin to decay if its destruction is postponed by artificial means, end quote. The Communist Manifesto of the Third International is written around the same thesis in the most pronounced form. If Russia today has differences with a capitalist economy where the private property relations have decayed and production is nationalized, these points are not to be dealt with. Excuse me, these points are not to be detailed for these points' own sake as being different. Nobody denies their differences. What is to be proved is that these differences alter the law of motion of the society, and this cannot be done because the contradictions of the society are rooted in the class relations of production, which are identical and determine all other relations. What was formerly private and uncontrolled by the very development of capitalist production becomes more and more, more, and more state-controlled. The antithesis of Stalinist society and the capitalist society being the same, the solution of their contradictions is the same. It can be stated in a sentence. The workers must take control of the process of production on a national and international scale. This achieved automatically according to the technical development and the relation with the world market, use values will begin to predominate. But with reasonable speed, the same must take place on an international scale, or the quest for surplus value in the world as a whole will drag down the socialist state unless it commands an exceptionally well-developed and extensive area. Quote, we live, end quote, said Lenin, quote, not in a state, but in a system of states, end quote. The consequences of this transformation will be, one, the individual development of the laborer, dot, 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 
The degradation of the Russian worker is an economic fact. Man is the greatest of all productive forces, and once his potentialities are released, the era of human freedom will begin. Quote, its fundamental premise is the shortening of the working day, end quote. Until then, society will be increasingly like Russia and Germany and plunging to destruction. Two, this release of the workers for creative labor and production will be immensely encouraged by the entry into productive labor of the millions of idlers and unproductive laborers who infest modern society. Three, production will be for social needs. The idea that if the bourgeoisie should nationalize production and property, the hope for socialism is a utopia. That is, a misunderstanding of the contradictions of capitalism which must be driven out of our movement. Such a transformation will solve nothing. The three points outlined above will be as far from realization as ever. A new society begins when the workers take power or when the world market is abolished by the domination of one capitalist state, which would be an unspeakable barbarism. Marxism knows no other other, quote, new, end quote, society, far less any progressive new society, either the emancipation of labor or increasing barbarism. Only in the most abstract sense can state property be said to be a higher form as monopoly capitalism was a higher form than pre-monopoly capitalism. Today we have reached a turning point. The pauperization of the worker, which was formerly relative, is now on a world scale absolute. Today, in the most advanced capitalist countries, he is on his way to slavery. In its present stage, capitalism, whatever capitalism's form, except in a few areas and for declining periods, can no longer maintain the worker even in the conditions of his previous slavery. Without the proletarian revolution, the state property form can be the vehicle of barbarism and the destruction of human society. Such terms as higher and lower forms have no meaning in the concrete circumstances. It is not the form of property, but the social relations of production which are decisive. Today, if the working class is master, the form is progressive. If it is not, the form is reactionary. Quote, in bourgeois society, living labor is but a means to increase accumulated labor. In communist society, accumulated labor is but a means to widen, to enrich, to promote the existence of the laborer, end quote. Any society today in which the aim is not to promote the existence of the laborer is doomed to crisis and disorder and will go always closer to barbarism until the workers take power. That is all there is to Marx, and as he himself states, on an understanding of this, all comprehension of the facts depends. On the basis of the above analysis, certain political conclusions follow automatically. They are a. No defense of Russia under any circumstances. The first condition for working out a long-term policy about Russia is to define the economic nature of the society and the historic character of the bureaucracy. It is bourgeois and therefore has no rights over the struggles of the workers for their democratic rights. The struggle for socialism is the struggle for democracy before or after the expropriation of the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy in Russia has to be expropriated, driven away from the bureaucracy's stranglehold over the process and the means of production. To do this, the proletariat mobilizes all the poor and all the oppressed of Russia. The proletariat is prepared without hesitation to restore private property to those peasants who wish it. It rejects United Front with Kerensky and all his scores of followers in Russia who ask the proletariat to fight for them so that they may get a factory for themselves. With Mensheviks and with any section of the working class movement or any other section of society, it forms a united front for what it considers to be working class demands and for nothing else. It forms these on its own conditions, and the revolutionary proletariat keeps its hands free and makes or breaks these attempts at united action as it sees fit in the interests of the struggle for power. Nothing in Marxism compels the proletariat to form a united front with any group at any time, except the proletariat thinks to the advantage of the proletariat to do so in its struggle for power.
B. Denunciation of the Communist, a Communist Party as the agent of a fascist power. It appears that in the minds of some, this excludes a united front with the Communist Party on a specific issue. The contention is not only stupid but dangerous. A united front is formed with a section of American workers mainly on their intentions against the American bourgeoisie or the world bourgeoisie, not on account of its belief in Stalinism. If it is not to be formed with them because the Communist Party is the agent of reactionary, a reactionary bureaucracy, which is the enemy of the workers and of socialism, that excludes the united front with the Communist Party for all those who do not believe that the working class is still the working excuse me, the working class is still the ruling class in Russia. In the case of Communist Party leader Browder, whom the American government attacked for obvious reasons, the Workers' Party will offer a united front. If the Communist Party, however, had called for a mass protest against the war in 1939, then with our present policy, the Workers' Party would have, should have refused. But even that refusal is not definitive, for according to the temper of the American proletariat, the strength of the Workers' Party, which is the party that obviously is the Shackman's party um, and that James is a member of at this point, for according to the temper of the American proletariat, the strength of the Workers' Party, the stage of development or disintegration of the Communist Party, the strength of the bourgeoisie, the Workers' Party may even under similar circumstances decide even to support a specific anti-war action by the Communist Party, even though the call was dictated originally by the interests of the Russian bureaucracy. This sophistry which indulges in superficial arguments of the above type must be rigorously rejected. It would be most dangerous for the Workers' Party if it allowed itself to be driven into considering the United Front as a collection of fixed laws instead of a tactical orientation within given circumstances towards a fixed goal. C. Propaganda for Socialism The Workers' Party must make it a first task in the Workers' Party's press and all other propaganda and agitation to preach the necessity of socialism, to explain that no modern society of any kind offers any solution to the problems of modern society, except a society in which the workers hold power. It must with special vigor denounce and expose the idea that fascism, managerial society, or bureaucratic state socialism are in any concrete sense progressive societies, or even could be, and it must do this by challenging their proponents on the fundamental economic categories and analysis of Marx. D. The Workers' Party must initiate a serious study of Marxian economics. The end.